Welcome to this very special episode of Marie TV and the Marie Forleo podcast. So we're doing something a little bit different today. I'm actually going to take you to a private event where I had the opportunity to sit down and have an amazing conversation with someone that I deeply admire, Dr. Joe Dispenza. If you don't know about Dr. Joe's work, I don't know where you've been hiding, but you definitely need to check him out after this interview. Dr. Joe has changed literally millions of people's lives, including mine. And we're going to kind of go behind the scenes and talk about not just his work, but also a bit about his business and his brand, which I think is amazing. So buckle up, get ready to take notes, and let's dive in. Yes. Good morning. Oh, (sighs) that was fun. Sorry, I missed that. Now I'm winded a little, so this is great. Um, So anyway, we're so excited to do this with y'all. So basically, when we were thinking about how to really set this conversation up, we were thinking about serving you all in a really beautiful way because one of the things that I'm clear about is this audience, you're all mission driven. And you're here and you work so hard and you are so committed to making a difference in other people's lives. And as an entrepreneur myself, it's, it's not an easy journey, is it? And Dr. Joe is someone that we all love and admire and respect. He's made a huge difference in my life. And so we're excited about having this conversation to unpack some of the things that maybe we don't get to talk with him about because we get so wonderfully immersed in the work that he does. So that I think this is such a fun opportunity to talk about some of the other aspects of what it takes to make an impact and how do you navigate that with being really amazing at your craft and having such integrity and then having all of these different business ambitions and then having a life too. So would that be okay if we go in that direction? Okay, so good. So Dr. Joe, I know that You had an experience back in 1986, right, triathlon that changed your life, and you made a deal with yourself that if you were ever able to walk again, that you were going to spend the rest of your life really studying and understanding the mind-body connection. I've heard you say this, and I love this. Sometimes in order order for us to wake up, we really need a wake-up call. Was that the wake-up call that inspired you to really study spontaneous remissions? Gosh, I, I, I really don't think I'd be sitting here. Uh, if I didn't have that seemingly tragic event uh, take place in my life. In 1986, when you have multiple compression fractures of your thoracic spine and you have bone fragments on the cord and you have the neural arch of one vertebrae compressing a cord uh, and four experts are telling you to have Harrington rod surgery. And I'm thinking as a young guy who's doing triathlons and, and running a martial arts studio and running a clinic, if I really want to spend the rest of my life living on addictive medications and, and having a limited expression of who I really want to be. And I think, you know, you reach this point, it's a dark night of the soul. And the dark night of the soul is when you weigh what you know against what you don't know. And you realize that nobody has the answers to where you're at in your life but you. And at the same time, nobody actually gets you because everybody's clinging to the known and you're way out in the unknown and you're looking for evidence. Someone out there like, is anybody doing this? And uh, it's so convenient to go back to the familiar. Yet, you know, as I said yesterday, a lot of times when nothing is making that feeling go away, you can't go back. You just can't go back and you gotta trust in the unknown. And so, for me personally, I think I was just young enough and probably had a little bravado at the time where I said no, and of course they thought I had a head injury, like this kid hit his head, like something's wrong with him, you don't don't say that. And um, you know, for me, I mean, I I just wanted to ask myself the question, there there is an intelligence in the body that's giving us life, that's keeping my heart beating, digesting my food, organizing trillions of functions on a cellular level, you know, mobilizing all kinds of different things, you know, checking my DNA expression, It's a grandiose intelligence that lives within me. I certainly can't do this healing. That somebody, something greater than me has got to do it. And I just said to myself, look, two things you got to do here. You can't let any thought slip by your awareness that you don't want to experience. 
That sounds really easy, except when you're in crisis or when you're in trauma, we tend to focus on the worst thing that could happen instead of the best thing that happened. I couldn't get my mind to do what I wanted it to do. The second thing is I gotta make contact with this intelligence, and I don't know how to do that, but I think if I could give it an, a picture, a design, I can give it a template, and I can start from one place and reconstruct every one of my vertebrae without losing my focus. I'd have to be present the entire time to give it a very clear model of what I wanted. And I went through an incredibly dark night of the soul because I couldn't get my mind to do what I wanted it to do. But I, I had nothing else. I really had nothing else to rely on. So it would take me hours. Every time I lost my focus and I started thinking if I'm living in a wheelchair, should I sell my practice, should I sell my home? You know, what, and I would stop and start all over again. And it turned into this thing that I just wanted to be able to accomplish. And it was no longer about healing for me. It was about going through and executing without losing my focus. And I didn't know it at the time, but I was getting super present and it got easier. Then I started noticing dramatic changes in my body, sensory-wise, motor-wise. And the moment I saw the changes, I knew that what I was doing was making a difference and no one can talk me out of it now. Now it's real for me. And you know you're in trouble in your life when your friends tap you on the shoulder when you have to make a decision. I had all these docs around me tapping me on the shoulder when I had to make the decision, they said, we, we know you're gonna make the right decision. And they all filed out of the room and they were going back to their comfortable lives and I thought, what they're really saying is I'm so glad I'm not you. Mm. And that initiation, uh, when I started to notice the dramatic changes in my health, changed me. I couldn't go back to being Joe Dispenza as he was. I, I could not go back to the same life that I had just been initiated through. I had to ask myself, what in the hell happened? Like, what happened to you? I mean, the body can heal itself, yeah, but compression fractures and all, how does that, how does that work? Like, I, have, I had bone height increases and all kinds of crazy things go on. I couldn't find the answers. In typical references, I used to go to University of Washington, the library, and pull out all the books. I couldn't find anything. I had to start studying epigenetics and neuroplasticity and psychoneuroimmunology. I had to really look for the information to kind of support what happened to me. And then I, I started asking, does anybody else have this go on? And so that's when I started opening my mind up to spontaneous remissions. And I interviewed hundreds of people uh, and from 17 different countries asking them the question. I couldn't find a diet, and I was a Puritan at the time. <laughs> I couldn't find an exercise routine. I mean, some people, you know, drank tequila, some people cussed, some people were celibate, some people weren't, some people ate meat, some people, I couldn't find anything that really was the reason that they were treating conventionally or unconventionally and either staying the same or getting worse and all of a sudden they got better. And that's when I realized the mind was the most strongest component. In fact, I went back and studied neuroscience because, of, because I couldn't find the answers anywhere else. And so the simple thing I asked myself is if these are the commonalities and this is what these people did and not knowing that they did it, we should be able to replicate it in other human beings, either people that are sick, maybe they could get better, or if people truly want to change, can we demystify the model of change to give people the tools that they have within their reach to begin to make measurable changes in themselves and in their lives? And in 1986, I'm telling you that the information wasn't that available, so I had to work really hard in getting people to even understand the concepts that how mind could affect the body or even affect their life. Fast forward to today, and everybody's informed. Everybody's like, well, I mean, it's a different world now. People are informed, and with information, then people can make different choices. And so it's led me on that process, but that was my wake-up call. And I was, I was young, I was successful, I had everything I wanted, and it was the worst thing that could have happened to me at that time in my life, but it turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to me. And I wouldn't be sitting here if I didn't have that experience. Let's talk about... After that experience happened, you made this commitment, you've kept this commitment for 35 years now. What was, was like the big first initial breakthrough of sharing your message, sharing your findings, sharing your research and your experience with the wider world? Was it What the Bleep in 2004? Yes, yeah, so, so when I filmed What the Bleep Do We Know, it was funny because they, they, the, the writer and producer sent me a manuscript. And this was in the days when they used to send it in an envelope. You know, the whole thing. Remember that? Well, some of you probably don't. But anyway, you sent in a big envelope, and it was just a big, fat 
thick set of papers. I mean, your husband's an actor, your partner's an actor, so you get it, right? So I went through the whole thing and redlined, bad science, bands, I can't say that, and I thought, this keep this guy busy for at least a year. I got the manuscript back two weeks later, and all we had is dialogue, and, and when what the bleep happened, I mean, uh, and the movie became sensational, it was really an, a change in consciousness for a lot of people. It was the science and theory of really questioning the nature of reality and this concept called how addicted we are to our emotions. But I paid attention to all those bleep conferences and all those events that we went to with the scientists and researchers. I wanted to listen to the questions that people asked. And the questions were, okay, <laughs> you create your reality, I get it, how do you do it? I thought it was a brilliant question. Next question is, okay, your personality creates your personal reality. Your personality is made up of how you think, how you act, and how you feel. If I want to change my personal reality, I've got to change my personality. Nothing changes in my life till I change. How do we change? Why is it so hard to change? And then the last question was, what do you do? And so we started teaching these events you know, around the world and, and giving people some tools and basic neuroscience and epigenetics and brain waves and electromagnetism, building a model. And you know, at the end of an event, people would say, oh, I, I feel a little better, you know, I have a better sense of well-being, but we weren't seeing any dramatic changes in people's health. And then it took about a year. And we just, I was running these events, and every time I'd run an event, someone would say, can you do another one? So we did a more evolved version, and then we did another evolved version, and then I said, I don't know anything else. I don't know anything else. <laughs> and then I started having profound mystical experiences, and that changed my view of the world dramatically. And I remember at one event, this woman with MS, sitting in a wheelchair after one meditation, stood up out of that throne and started dancing around. And when I saw that happening, I knew something had to be taking place inwardly in her. In other words, there must have been some gene regulation that happened as a result of her inner process, and that's when everything changed for me. That's when I got a team of scientists and neuroscientists and biologists and partnered with the HeartMath Institute. We started building this model of understanding. We have 18,000 brain scans now, thousands and thousands of HR V measurements. We got gene testing that's done, telomere testing that's done, immune regulation, you know, thousands of different metabolites. At this point, I, w I wanted to see if that person's subjective experience of whatever that was could be calibrated objectively. And once we understood that information, can we teach transformation better? And if you can do it and capture that information and teach transformation better, you can shorten the distance between really the thought and the experience of what a person wants. And, and I think that the science has become the contemporary language to demystify that process. And once you use tradition or culture, religion, divide an audience, but science creates community. And people want to use that as a language now. It's the contemporary language. You communicate with your patients in terms of science. I mean, how many people here run a clinic and the first thing you say to a patient when they start talking about their health condition is, that's not true. I used to say that every day. That's not true. That is not the truth. So then that information then that people are beginning to understand is, is theoretical and philosophical and now, <laughs> There's too many testimonials. I mean, we're just talking backstage. Every single day we have something that challenges my belief. That challenges my belief in what's possible. And when I see the scientists running the same study over and over again, he's running the same study five times over again, then changing the study and running it a different way and getting the same result, I know he's changing his belief right there. I know she's changing her belief. They're looking for something else to occur, and it actually doesn't. This is new information. It's a discovery. And the cool part about it is nobody is so special to be excluded from that phenomenon. So the spontaneous remissions brought me to an understanding of, my God, we really do have to move from one state of mind to another state of mind. I mean, we have to unlearn and relearn. We have to break the habit of the old self and reinvent the new self. We have to prune synaptic connections and sprout new connections. We've got to unfire and unwire and refire and rewire deprogram and reprogram. Lose your mind and create a new one. Unmemorize emotions that have been conditioned and stored in the body and then recondition the body to a new mind and to a new emotion. And so, the, so, the, so the science then became the practical tools that we could speak with a lot more certainty. And the real-time brain scans and the real-time measurements we were taking during meditations 
blew most of our minds because we just didn't expect to see what we, what we discovered. So I'm curious, too, about your journey, because I believe you've written about this, that after What the Bleep, you also had a moment personally, right, as someone who obviously was now experiencing this wide exposure to a public that perhaps you hadn't had access before. And I think you wrote about, you found, you were finding external success, but internally there were challenges. And then, did I read this correctly, that you took a six-month sabbatical to really kind of step back and reassess? I think the greatest relationship that you could ever have is with yourself. Uh, and taking time to be in the presence of yourself and ask yourself important questions like, are you happy? Who am I? And instead of getting up and getting on your cell phone and getting distracted, sit with your triple filtered water or a glass of wine or whatever you're into, JJ, but whatever you're into. <laughs> almond milk, whatever it is. <laughs> Gluten-free bread and lactose-free cheese, whatever you're into. <laughs> Sit down and answer the question without being distracted. The contemplation process is the building process neurologically. And for me, I was, <laughs> I was just a guy. I'm a guy who loves God. I'm a guy who loves the divine. I'm a guy who loves mystery. I, I'm the guy who just never stops dovetailing information. I mean, that's just me. And I never really planned on doing any of this. I mean, my theories on life is make it up as you go along and take the value and run. And, and uh, what the bleep became a sensation. And, and all of a sudden, I went from a normal guy to being a rock star. And I was traveling around the world and doing conferences all over the place. And I reached this point where I realized that I wasn't living the work. And that really bothered me. I was disturbed by that. I was really uncomfortable. And when you get uncomfortable and nothing's making that discomfort go away, it's time to evolve. It's time to make a different choice. And I, I clearly heard in my head during one meditation, stop making the same choices and pause. I didn't know what that meant, except that I knew that I was relying on all of this external stimulation to build an identity that I really wasn't. And then I had to show up for people and look a certain way and act a certain way, and that, that wasn't me. And it got disturbing for me. And I had this gap between the way I appeared and the way I really was. And I didn't make time for myself and make time to be the example. I mean, my motive is always be the example of everything that I teach. If I'm not, I'm not, I shouldn't be up here. Uh, I shouldn't be leading in my clinic if I, if I don't live those principles myself, if I don't live my life that way. And, and, and so, um, you know, and the, at the height of uh, my popularity, I disappeared. I canceled all my <laughs> events. My friends thought I was on crack or something. They thought I lost my mind. Because you know what? They were saying you could make so much money. And I said, I don't really care. I know how to make money. I really don't care about money. I really don't care, I care about how happy I'm going to be with myself. And I broke from the world for six months and retreated. And I really decided that if I presented myself back to the world, that I wasn't going to be seduced by it in the same way that I really wanted to be the example of everything that I taught, and I wanted to lead events in a way that empowered people. I never wanted it to be about me. I wanted it to be about you. I want you to have the realization that you're the creator of your life. And so six months of just detoxing from all of that arousal, all that stimulation, and, and pretty much lighting myself on fire and hoping that the phoenix would rise, you know, and, and those six months were, you know, again, that period of where you're really questioning who you are and, and if it's valuable for you. And, and, and I remembered that my decision was to go out and to, if I was ever able to walk again, I'd spend the rest of my life studying the mind-body connection, and mind over matter. That's the deal that I had with myself. So I stepped back out into the world with a different person. I, I got beyond all of that stuff that so many people get distracted by. And for me, it was a defining moment that I just said, if I could close the gap between how I appear and who I really am, <laughs> I'm free. I, I could be anybody I want, and I, and, and, and I could be happy with myself. And I think when we're truly happy with ourselves, we're happy with others. And that people that are unhappy with themselves, they punish other people so they can feel as unhappy as they are. And I didn't want to have happiness be dependent on anyone or anything. I wanted to have that sense of wholeness where I felt good about me and I had to make time to do the work and I have to make time for myself. I, 
I have to enjoy the presence of myself and ask myself, what well, do you know? At what point do you stop believing that you create your reality? What is that point? What is that chronic disbelief that you have? What is that persistent belief that says that's the end? Like when things go really well, you create it, and when it, they don't, you don't? That doesn't work that way. So I just wanted to re 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 revive my model to a certain degree and, and get back into the practical application uh, so that I actually could be the example um, for everybody. So that's why I did it. One thing that I love that you shared so much, and I think this is so relevant for business owners and people that create content and that are interested in sharing a message with others, is there is a persistent fear, especially where we are right now in terms of social media, right? And how much information is out there and how many people can kind of speak back and talk back. And you shared that you used to be concerned about folks who would criticize you and calling your work pseudoscience, and that at a certain point early on in your journey, you would write with the critics in mind. I've actually done that in my work too, where I can hear what people are gonna say, and then so my creativity starts leaning towards those people. And then I love that you wrote at a certain point, you were done with that. I, I wanted to know if you could talk us through that evolution in thinking, because I think as creators, mm -hmm. Writing for the critics or having the negativity bias continue pull us in that direction, or as we're creating our own podcasts or our own material, I see a, a lot of heads nodding in this audience. So I was wondering if you can speak to that. God, I, 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 you know, I think if you really want to be a leader, you should study great leaders, and I think all great leaders in history are on were, were uncompromising. I just don't care if they, were, they did it for a good effect or a bad effect; they just were uncompromising to their vision. And, and when you're young and you write your first book and you're writing that book and you're, you're detailed and specific about making sure you cross all your T's and dot all your I's and your references are all in place and you want to go a little further for that person who's in the back of the room or that person who's the critic that's going to judge your work. And I think it's a healthy place to start because it creates a little rigor. And then I just had a lot of people that hated me. I don't know what I ever did to them. <laughs> and, 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 and I had to really sit down with myself and say, do you think that person's ever going to like you, Joe Dispenza? <laughs> They're never going to like you anyway, so forget them. There's plenty of people that do want to hear you. And then when I took my attention off those people, I started getting happier. And then when I started seeing the results that were taking place, I could care less what they said about me. I could care less. But I do want to say something about that that's really important because after what the bleep do we know, I was invited to universities all over the United States and I was with some of those uh, people in the movie and they were so excited. Oh, we're going to be in the, with the university. And I'd say, I'd walk on the stage, I'd see the quantum physicists, I'd see the uh, department head of medicine there. And I said, hang on, this is going to be an ambush. I said, what are you talking about? They're going to ambush us. They had PowerPoint presentations, just trying to prove everything wrong. And I tell you, it was my, it was my greatest moments. And we are defined by our adversity. And I said, I'm going to turn this whole audience around. I don't care how long it takes. They, their intention was to disprove. That was what they wanted to do. And, and it caused me to really look to see what I knew. And I remember the end of this one conference, this little thing we did in, the, in, in, a, in a university, that people were yelling at the scientists saying, hey, we don't want to hear you any longer. <laughs> and and the, he said, well, we're closing this place down because we got to go. And the janitor in the back of the room said, I'll stay. <laughs> and I knew in that moment that people wanted to be informed and empowered. Because knowledge is power, but knowledge about yourself is self-empowerment. And so then it shifted in that point where all of a sudden I just decided that I really didn't care. I really don't care uh, what people say about me. I really don't care. I don't even look. I mean, I don't, I've never even been on my, my YouTube thing. They were asking me, like, or social media, I'm not that guy. I'm not that guy. I'm the guy that really is interested in delivering a message better each time that we are interacting with people or seeing the feedback in my life that's showing me that... I mean, it was, Telling somebody backstage, I mean, my belief is challenged all the time. Like, somebody grew their thyroid back just recently, and I was on t camera when they told me that, and I was like, what? Like, <laughs> what do you mean they grew their thyroid back? That's not possible. <laughs> and, and, 
she had her thyroid completely removed. They cut the thing out, and then she was taking her medication, and she was getting sick, and she went to the doctor. All her, all her, all her values were normal. All her thyroid hormones were normal. They, they, they imaged her, her, her throat, and she had a thyroid there. <laughs> and I, I was bothered by that. <laughs> I said, I want to see the scans. I don't, I don't believe it, and I have to change my belief. I mean, how far down the rabbit hole do you want to go? I am not going to argue with people any longer about whether this works or not. I already know it does. I just want to give people the opportunity to experience it. That's all. So I think one of the other things that is a challenge, and it can be a challenge for people like us who care deeply about the integrity of our work, whatever our craft is, whatever we're focused on. And we also care deeply about the success of the mission and how that kind of comes to life in the business itself and growing a team and leading. So I'm curious, Dr. Joe, if at various points in your journey, have you ever experienced challenges in the time it takes to keep pushing and discovering the new aspects of the craft because you're always evolving and having the team evolve and grow and having the mission get out there? And if you could speak to any of the ways that you've navigated those. Gosh, um, now I'm speaking from my present state of ignorance. I just want to say that. <laughs> Um, I think it's trial and error. I'm, I'm not a type of person that's afraid to fail. I really don't even see it as failure. I just see it as an opportunity to, to do it again, do it better. What, what do I need to change about myself to produce a different outcome? I think leadership and leading a team is, it takes great effort and great work. And, and you are all so mission driven and, and mission motivation is the highest form of motivation that's been studied. Uh, people who are duty motivated or mission motivated or have a purpose, a vision that's bigger than them, that is the reason they get up in the morning. And for me, it's always been that. I want to I wanna be a part of transformation. I want to witness that. I, wanna, I stood next to a woman who opened her eyes on the beach in Cancun, and she was able to see for the first time. I wanted to be there for that. I wanted to be there for that moment. I wanted to remember what's possible. That, so the mission is the highest form of motivation. The next form of motivation is called personal conviction motivation. And people who are personally convicted are the ones that say, I'm going to do this because I say that I'm going to do it. It's a high form of motivation, but it's not the highest form. People who have a mission naturally have personal conviction. The next form is called ethics or morality motivation. It's a little bit polarized. You know, if you're good and bad, right and wrong. You know, if you're bad, you want to be good. If you're good, you want to be bad. If you're, you, know, you know that game. It's not a very high form of motivation, but people can function that way in polarity, but people who truly have a mission, have personal conviction, will naturally have a sense of ethics and morality. The next form of motivation is self-aggrandizement motivation. Hey, look at me, I'm famous, I'm popular, or whatever, not a very high form of motivation. People spend their whole life looking for that moment, but if you have the mission, if you have personal conviction and you stay with it, and you have a sense of morality and ethics, you will get the attention and the, and the recognition that you need. By the way, the lowest form of motivation is money motivation. Mm -hmm. But if you follow the sequence, money always comes as a side effect. The most selfless to the most selfish. And so I have to remind myself every day of what my mission is, and it is to transform individuals in order to transform the world or transform the culture. And I have to make a lot of hard decisions every single day about 2024. I gotta make a lot of hard decisions about which direction we're gonna go, how we're gonna do the science. I have to make a lot of hard decisions all the time, and I can't do any of this without my team. And how do you build a great team? For me, they have to share the same mission. They have to share the same vision. They gotta share the same passion. But what are the components that keep them moving in that direction? Like the mission of going in a certain direction. What keeps them uh, in that direction? It's just really two simple things, and one is uh, called competence. You gotta be really badass good at what you do. So good at what you do that you own it, that you've mastered it. If you have that level of competence with accountability, like you say you're gonna do something and you do it, or you're asked to do something and you do it uh, because you say you're gonna do it. If you put those three things together, the mission, the competence, and accountability, I think that you have excellence in an individual, and you have trust amongst the culture. In other words, I don't have to look to see what you're doing, because I know you're doing your job really well. Now, the person who can't balance those three things will be outstanding. They'll stand out and someone will have to stop doing what they're doing 
and all of a sudden have to help that person. Now, that happens, uh, uh, you know, sometimes, but usually people can evolve and self-correct. And so, for me personally, we have gone through so many stages of growth. I mean, we interact with hundreds of different countries around the world now. We have thousands and thousands of thousands of people in, in community, and it's not easy to be able to integrate and interact with the world in the proper way. And, and so for us, we have to keep learning. Mm. That you get, you, if you're in emergency, if you're in stress, you're in survival, you can't learn. It's not a time to learn. No one new information can enter the nervous system that isn't equal or relevant to the emotion that the person is experiencing. And you got to be able to teach your team how to shorten the refractory period of their own emotional reactions. If they can't self-regulate and control their emotions, there'll always be a gap in perception between the way things appear and the way things really are. And so many times you have this period of growth and you don't have the systems in place, the infrastructure to be able to handle that growth, and there's a breakdown that takes place. Me personally, I've never seen that as bad. I've just seen it as a blind spot. And so for, for me, we just keep hiring more people. And, and, and we hire experts, people that are really good at what they do that get the message in and are able to represent it. But along the way in, in making those hard decisions, uh, I have listened to attorneys, I've listened to consultants, I've listened to experts, and a lot of times I just look at them and I say, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna compromise myself. I will never do that. Yeah. I won't. I don't know what I'm gonna do, but I'm not gonna do that. And I usually say, surely there's a potential in the quantum field where this can change. And and that to me becomes the experiment. I like the experiment to see if I can produce an effect in my life by changing something about myself. And so. If you are mission driven and you have something that you really have that is of value to people, you will never have to sell it. I, I have been at enough business conferences where I've heard people talk on backstage and I walk out and I go, God, I'm really sorry. I'm going to tell you to do the exact opposite because I don't believe in any of those gimmicks. I really don't believe in any of that. I think that if you're real, you tell people the truth and you have evidence-based stuff that can change people's lives and you can have them remember to make better choices in their life. The research shows once you start making good choices, you'll keep making more good choices. Keeping people uh, in that place takes an enormous amount of energy and information. And the model that we're developing in terms of healthcare should never end because health is an ongoing process. Certainly, my own personal experience of what I understand health to be is very different than it was just a year ago. So knowledge and information to evolve our experience all the time, it's the precursor to the experience. So if I had dark nights of the soul in running my company, absolutely. Have I had people that we've had to let go of because of all kinds of reasons? Absolutely, but I'm not afraid to lose, I'm not afraid to fail, I'm just, I just don't wanna lose the lesson in the process, so it's a constant process of engagement and I have to spend time alone to be able to answer those questions. I'm not gonna rely on other people to do that. For me, it's important for me to get very clear on it. And, and sometimes it's a lonely process. I think it's so important too, because in the world that we're in, and I've certainly experienced this myself, where you can kind of consult with experts, whether it's an attorney, it's someone who says, I am the best in the world at this, and they start giving you a piece of advice, and your gut just, help, like, absolutely friggin' not. <laughs> like, exactly. no way in hell. Yeah. And I think it's so important for all of us to support each other in that, because we are creating into the unknown, and to do something super unique like what you've built, and so incredibly transformational, to be able to keep turning inside to hear that voice. Hmm. It's critical. Thank you. Thank you. So, yes, you can clap for that. That's a good one. So... Slightly on the more technical side, but I love this, is there was a point in your web presence where it was not necessarily anymore about the Dr. Joe show, all of the branding, it was about the community. And it was about this shift into the stories and the people. And I'm curious if you noticed any impact, whether it was for yourself or your team or just how it felt when you made that shift. Yeah, so when the pandemic happened, yeah. um, I was going, I was traveling 300 days out of the year. I mean, I was on the road quite a bit, and, um, and we had such momentum, both with the scientific discoveries that we were, we were uncovering, and, 
in the, in the human testimony, just the testimonials of people telling their stories. I was completely blown away, and my biggest concern when there were, we couldn't run events is we were going to lose momentum. Like we had some really serious momentum, and, and all of a sudden we went to a, a halt. And so I had been so busy up until that point that I really never looked at, I never even looked at my website. <laughs> How many people have experienced that? You've just got your head down for so long, know. and you're like, What? I didn't even look at it. I didn't even know, like, it didn't matter to me. I thought it was, I thought it was all handled. And I got on the website and I was like, oh my God, like, <laughs> this is horrible. <laughs> and then I started asking the question. You know when you ask the question, who did this? <laughs> You're like. <laughs> who is responsible? And you don't hear any, it's crickets. <laughs> Nobody's throwing anybody under the bus and I realize it's everybody. <laughs> And so when I looked at my website and I started, look, I never do this. I just never do this. I'm always in the process. So I started looking at my website and there's pictures of me and I started looking at other people's websites. I said, this is not about me. I want to make it about community. That community is the future. I just remember saying, we got to change everything. We have to change everything where people thought I was crazy. And, and of course, I had to give him a little tequila. You know, we had Zoom calls with tequila just to loosen him up a little bit. <laughs> uh, but really, the, the truth is, is, is that if, if you witness, as you're witnessing just in this room, a sense of community, a sense of connection. Uh, when I was watching what was happening in our week-long retreats, so that in seven days these people were transformed to such a degree, and how much love was in the room, and how much there was care and kindness, and everybody excited and free, and transformation looked really wonderful. I started remembering that that's what it really is about, that it's collective networks of observers that really determine reality, and we have to invest in community. We have to invest in that whole model of people actually being formed in the right way. And so for me, it was a simple choice to make uh, because I, 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 I love us. I, I love people who are actually questioning the nature of reality and stretching their mind into another experience. And, and the people that, that actually do it, um, they prove to themselves how, how powerful they really are. So I, I never wanted it to be about me. I always wanted it to be about the, the community. And I, and, and I love when people stand on the stage and tell their story. I love it. I love seeing someone with ALS come to an event and then walk from the back of the room onto the stage and they're telling their story and they're not talking about anything else but change. The more I changed, the more I healed. And I loved seeing people's faces when the four minute mile is standing on the stage. I'm looking at the audience of 2,000 people and everybody's leaning in. There's truth right in front of them that person is speaking the truth, and there's, there's nothing like a good story. And so it's not about me, it's about us, and what I love about our community is that we do the work. We do the work, not like, oh, geez, i got to go create my future this morning. <laughs> I'm really tired. Don't expect anything to happen, because you're going to get up as the same person who sat down. But the people who do this work, and they see the novelty of coincidences and synchronicities and opportunities start showing up in their life, you bet they're gonna jump out of bed in the morning and can't wait to do it again to see if the experiment continues. And when that starts to occur, you can't wipe the smile off your face. And your friends think you switched medications or that you <laughs> got a facelift or something happened to you. Something's weird about you. God forbid you're happy without them. You know, like all of a sudden, some, what's going on with you? And the people in our, in our community are doers, and, and I love that because the, the experiment always continues. It's not, it's not like, well, how come I'm not healed? I can't, I can't say that anymore. You just can't say that any longer. I've seen the sickest people with 50 brain tumors, tumors all through their spine. I've seen them with all kinds of stage four cancers and all kinds of paralysis, blindness, deafness. I've seen crazy stuff. They had every reason in the morning to say, I don't feel like doing it. They could have surrendered to that feeling that they couldn't think greater than how they feel, but they showed up and did the work anyway, and they overcame their body a little bit more. There were days they were riddled with fear. 
because the doctors told them they were stupid and they're going to die. And that, that moment was such a defining moment for them. They could have said, I can't do my meditation today. I'm, I'm, I, there's too much fear. They could have surrendered to fear, but instead they chose themselves, showed up, and overcame their fear a little bit more that day and surrendered to love. There were days that they had a lot of doubt because their values were getting worse. Their family was worried about them. They didn't feel good. They were getting sicker. They had every reason to not do their meditation, to do the work, but nothing else was working. And the only belief they still had was in themselves. They showed up anyway and overcame their doubt a little bit more. There were days where they could have shelved the whole thing and said, I'm too busy. I got kids. I got appointments. I got dinners. I got social things to do. I don't have time to do the work. They made the time to do the work, and it's the overcoming process that is the becoming process. And the story that they tell, the allegory that they tell, naturally causes someone in the audience, as I said yesterday, who's facing the same rare genetic disorder that that person is facing. And they look at them and they say, she doesn't look any different than me. If she can do it, I can do it. And sometimes we have at our events four people with the same health condition. By the end of the week, four of them Complete reverse because one person told the story on the stage. I don't know how that happens. All I know is that it's in the air on some level. And so community to me is where, the, where, where, where we really begin to make changes in consciousness because once you're aware of possibility, uh, there's a change in consciousness. I've been to your events. I love them. I have so much fun. Told you that, big fan. And one of the things that I was so struck by and it just made my heart explode, was how different they are from so many other things that are in our industry. So for example, there's no ascension model. Like you can't go do anything extra with Dr. Joe. It's just what it is. There's no VIP seating, for example. There's none of the things that many of us have just been exposed to. And I'm curious from a business how things operate point of view, if there's <laughs> anything that you've discovered for yourself that you're like, here's got some of the things we do differently. Because I, I love it. And again, it's, it's really, really inspiring. Um, I think we throw a really good party. <laughs> I, I really think that when people come together, they're nervous. Uh, we, we require them to come prepared. I tell them, don't come. Don't come if you don't do the online course. I'm not waiting for you. I'm not waiting. I'm not, we got bodies to heal. We got lives to change. We have futures to create. I'm very straight with our community very straight with them. I, I'm going to give them numerous opportunities to overcome themselves, numerous opportunities to connect. I'm going to break it down. I'm going to say it as many ways as I can. I'm not going to stop believing in them. I'm not going to stop believing in possibility. And all we need is that one person to break through that one level of consciousness, to pierce that veil. And once that happens, then the rest is easy. Now, have I evolved? God, I hope so. My definition of surrender today is way different than it was just three months ago. I have a very strong sense for sound and music now. I know the words that I say. I know the words that I say that will change brainwave patterns. I know the rhythm now, how to say them. I know the sound of the music that enhances resonance and cross-frequency coupling in the brain. We've seen, I know how to induce gamma by looking at the real-time scans. And so I want to make knowledge and information fun. And I don't want people to just listen to me. I'm going to challenge them, and then I've got to turn to somebody next to them and explain it. If you can't explain it, it's not wired in your brain, and you're going to doubt what you're doing. But if you can explain that what and why, the how gets easier. So it's a progression over, over time. And each day, there's a model, and then the experience of that model, and then people begin to change. We evolve the experience of the model a little bit more. I'm never going to tell people a lie. I'm just not that type of person. I'm, I want to be really straight with them. I want to be really clear with them. I want to provide the sound science for them to understand. I want to give them examples. I want them to believe in themselves. I've discovered something really cool. This last year, I was watching this group of people. and There was a great group of people in Mexico, in Cancun. We were running this event on the beach. We did four walking, five walking meditations that week, where they, just, they were just ready. And something amazing happened. I was watching all these people, and I realized that they were just super worthy. They kept showing up for themselves. If they stopped showing up for themselves, they would have never had that last moment. 
and it caused them to show up, continuously show up, and all of a sudden they just felt worthy to receive. They just were worthy to receive, and I think the universe only gives us what we think we're worthy of receiving. So I'm always challenging myself, challenging the model. I'm pushing the envelope a little bit more. We have advanced follow-ups now where people who have done the week-longs can come, and I, these are people that, are, that do the work. And so what we're looking at now is can we see the same changes in advanced meditators in three and a half days that we see in novice meditators? If you haven't seen the data on novice meditators, what happens in seven days, it's remarkable. So I, I really want learning to be fun. I want the experience of what people have to be fun. And then I want them to walk back in their lives, renewed, refreshed, and connected to their future and believing in their future more they, than they believe in their past. And the only time you believe in your future more than your past is when you feel the emotions of your future. The moment you default to the familiar emotions, you can't see that future anymore and you disbelieve it. And that's why people do the work over and over again so they can believe and keep it alive uh, in their minds and in their hearts. So we, we go at it as many ways as we can. We do seated meditations, standing walking meditations, laying down meditations. We're chasing the mystical. We're inducing trance. We're doing as much as we can. They're full days, 6 in the morning till 7 at night, 4 in the morning till 8 at night. You ask those people if they're happier than heck. Well, where's all that energy coming from? Well, they're interacting with energy and frequency, and it's having an effect on their biology. And then they're in a ballroom. You see all these changes to suggest that they're in a different environment. Now, I don't know about you, but I've been to enough ballrooms. They don't look really spectacular to me. <laughs> the environment isn't that strong to signal so many biological changes, and yet the novice meditators in seven days look like they're in a completely different environment. That's how many genetic changes are taking place. Not one, not two, thousands. To suggest they're in a different environment and they're in a ballroom, well, where are all those changes coming from? They're changing their internal state and the side effect of that is the body produces an endogenous set of pharmaceuticals. According to our research, it suggests that those pharmaceuticals work better than any pharmaceutical on the market. Amazing, okay, so we only got a few minutes left. I've got two more questions. One, what has been the most challenging part for you in your mission so far, and what have you learned from it? Hmm. Um, I think, I think you know, I have to be honest with myself that I, I run a lot of companies, and I have to listen to a lot of people. I have to be on a lot of Zoom calls, and I've got to make decisions, and that's kind of, you know, that's the routine, linear stuff that I have to do, and I have to be informed, and I, it's a lot. And, but I have to balance that with my creativity. Like, I, I, I'm always interested in evolving our meditations. I'm always interested in evolving the message. I'm always interested in trying something new and working with different people. Um, and so trying to balance, I think, my creative side with all of the linear stuff um, uh, can be challenging at times. And sometimes I go from three Zoom calls to the sound studio, and I gotta get in my, I gotta get to a different part of my brain to be able to do a new meditation or whatever. So, um, for me personally, it's trying to balance both my creative side uh, with my with my linear side. How many people relate to that? Yeah, yeah exactly. Because I just want to play. I mean, right. that's really what I want to do. And I can't be creative unless I'm playful. That's right. I saw. Excuse me. I'm bad at it when I when I'm not when I'm not playful. So, okay. Last question. Um, as we wrap. We've talked a lot about mission. Is there anything that, that you're excited about that is driving you even more than the general mission these days to keep going? Because as I watch you and as I witness you and as I experience your work again, it's made such a huge difference in my life. It's really exciting because you are so playful and I know there's always new frontiers. So anything that you want to share about what's coming up for you or what's this next frontier that's really driving your mission? God, I'm just, again, as I said yesterday, I'm so hopeful for the first time in a long time about us as human beings. I'm really hopeful for us. I'm, I'm changing my belief on a daily basis. I watched people after our last event in Niagara Falls, the last healing that we did on those beautiful people. I watched them saunter up down the center aisle and drop their canes and crutches off. I never thought I would be seeing that in, in my lifetime. The scientists that we have on our scientific team were very skeptical. 
And now they see meditation as medicine. And I want to change that conversation in healthcare about self-regulation. I want to change that conversation to show people really that, they, that, that, that their involvement in their own personal health and their own personal life matters. That they don't need anyone or anything outside of them to change their internal state. And if they do decide to take something outside of them, it will actually enhance the outcome. You can teach people how to, how to do that. So the science that we're doing now, we're doing you know, functional PET uh, MRIs and PET scans. We're doing all kinds of sophisticated stuff with breath. We're looking at tears now. Everybody cries at our events. There's, there's a lot of information in those tears. Let's, let's get as much information as we possibly can to have the model to be as complete as possible so that people actually, when they sit down to do the work, can assign meaning to it and have no doubt in the outcome. And, and I think, you know, with the science that we're doing now, balanced with, God, so many amazing testimonials, I have no idea uh, what's going to happen next. I really don't. <laughs> Thank you so much for who you are and for oh. who you've been to so many of us. And thank you for taking the time thank today. You, it's great. Thank you so much. Give this man a hand. Come on. Was that awesome or what? Now, if you enjoyed that conversation, which I hope you did, I'd love to know what were the insights? What were the ahas? What were the takeaways for you? Leave a comment below and let me know. And by the way, if you are watching this here on YouTube and you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, then you need to subscribe so you don't miss a thing. If you're listening to this on the podcast and if you haven't subscribed to that, what are you waiting for? Go subscribe. And until next time, stay on your game and keep going for your big dreams because guess what? The world really does need that very special gift that only you have. Thank you so much for listening, and I'll catch you next time. If you're feeling massive resistance, it's a good sign because it shows you that the project you're working on is really important to you, and you really have to do it.